Blog Talk Radio, the world's largest online radio network. Hello, this is James Tate, the Cinema Podcast Show, and my very special guest today is actress Susan Blakely. Susan won a Golden Globe for her performance as Julie Prescott in the television miniseries Rich Man, Poor Man. She started movies like The Towering Inferno, Report to the Commissioner, Concord, Airport 79, Capone, The Lords of Flatbush, and Over the Top. Those last three have a particular actor in common, and we'll be talking about all of this. And now we are getting connected to Susan Blakely. Hello. Susan Blakely. Hello. This is James Tate. Hi, James. How are you? I'm a little tired. I just was just raced in the door from my book club and then Costco, but I'm here. I made it. Okay, well, great. Yeah, I'm. Uh, I'm, I'm so uh, glad you're on here. I've had a great month. I've been watching almost nothing but Susan Blakely movies and TV shows. So. Oh my lord! I wish I'd done some better stuff. Although I got to do some good stuff. <laughs> oh come on, no. You're you're a true fan. I am a true fan, and you know I think Rich Man Poor Man took up a lot of that time. Boy, that's long. I, yeah, I'm impressed. I mean, I, I hadn't seen it in years, and recently I watched um, the first four hours, but that was as far as I got, so good for you. <laughs> well, that's that's the best part. I think the first four hours is where uh, where your character, Julie Prescott, is really prominent. In fact, I would say that even though the title is Rich Man, Poor Man, you, you are equal with uh, Nick Nolte and Peter Strauss in that. I mean, really, as far as the character goes. Yes, you know, thank you. It should have been rich man, poor man, I don't know, middle-income girl. <laughs> right, yeah. I, I, I was trying to figure out a, a good title because uh, Julie Prescott, she was very adventurous. Um, now, the the movie starts out, or the, the, the show, miniseries, starts out in the 40s, and so you get to play a character with, of varying ages. Now, in the beginning, how how old uh, you played a character your own age in the beginning, or no, actually younger? Well, so thank you. You're so sweet. Yes, I, I I was I think I was about 25 when when wow. I, when we shot it, and maybe 26 when it came out. I can't remember exactly, but it was um, yes, about 25, 26. I'd already been modeling, and and when when the when the show starts out, I'm playing. Um, I think I'm still in high school. I'm 17. Oh, okay. We're all 17. We're, no, wait a minute. That can't be because Peter and Nick aren't the same. Oh, that's right. Nick's character, Nick Nolte's character, Tom yeah. Jordash, is already out of is out of high school. And and, and Peter Strauss's character, uh, Rudy Jordash, and I are still in high school. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, it's a uh, it's a great now, now playing this character. This is from the character in the 40s. Yeah, she's a very independent woman. I mean, what, what, how would you describe Julie and and how you played her? I, I thought it was such a great character. Well, I think what's interesting about her, and it is as you ask, and I'm just thinking for the first time maybe, is that coming from a small town like like she lived in upstate New York, um, it ha she has that thing that so many. Um, I think especially girls have where they want to get out. They want some excitement. They want to go to the big cities. They they want to live life and do things. And and this was, I mean, obviously obviously this is before the whole hippie revolution, but the women's revolution was starting. Not that she knew any of that, but if you just think in terms of what women had been like. Now it's I I don't remember in the book, but in the movie you just see the single mother raising uh, my mother Gloria Graham from. Uh, from from Oklahoma, saying, "I'm just a girl who can't say no," right? She yeah. played she played the mother, and you never see you never saw a father. So I think it was that her mother worked in the factory in the town, and she assumed that I would too. And 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 in fact, she's a little disgusted with me that I think that's too good for me. I mean, I mean that I'm too good for that. But she, um, I just think that my character feels like there's more to life, and and and. And I was just thinking because I actually had a farm upstate New York when I lived in New York City, and there were people all around there, and I, I hear there still are who have never gone into New York City, even though it's three hours away. In fact, there's a line I remember saying, and you will, you'll remember it better because you saw it more recently, where I say to Peter uh, Rudy, I say um, something about this isn't New York City, he says, and I say it's not even Poughkeepsie. Yeah. <laughs> I said, you know, we were in this little town. Uh, yeah. What was the name of the town? Do you remember? Oh gosh! Oh, 
I'll, I'll, I'll um, just keep talking. I'm going to remember because yeah, I, yeah. They, they mentioned the name of the town. They do a lot, yeah. And it's anyway, it's it's a small town, and you know the factory is the whole thing, and the man who runs the factory, Robert Reed's character, is the one that um, that Julie ends up having an affair with. Yeah. And it's mainly it's it's that it's that my boyfriend, uh, Peter. And this happens with women of a certain age. I mean, you know, maybe it used to. I don't know what's going on anymore. But when girls are that age and they're ready, they're ready to experiment, and and they're ready. And and boys are younger. Boys are just more immature at the same age. And yeah. so, so when Peter won't mess around with me, Rudy won't mess around with me. <laughs> I start an affair with Robert Reed's character. Um, oh, I'm trying to remember the name of his character. Do you remember? Oh, I could, I could find that. Yeah, Robert Reed was. Uh... Who but go was ahead he? and keep talking. I'll find um, that. Yeah. Anyway, so. Like Quimby or Quigley or something like that. I, I can't remember. But it gosh, was. you know, I should have looked at this. So I'd be a little more familiar. No, but I good. love, by the way, for Robert Reed, this was a very unusual part for him because he had been on, wasn't he on the Brady Bunch? Oh, yeah, Brady Bunch, yeah. That's... And, and, and that was, uh, you know, he, he was so excited to do something that was so different. He played sort of a, a debauched. You know, Playboy. I mean, his family mm-hmm. had money, and and you don't. I in the movie, in the TV, in the miniseries, we didn't go into. They didn't go into depth of what what his background really was in terms of a marriage or anything. But you didn't get the idea that he'd been married. He just he you know he saw me and he you know and 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 in the end, I leave him too. <laughs> I mean, my character was like she was going to enjoy life and experiment life and experiment, and she she just had a different sort of. Um, she, she, her sensibilities, her 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 level of contentment wasn't the same as other people in that town. Yeah, and um, you know, as what I noticed watching this entire first part, you know, not book two, but the first part, is that your character is the one who really ha- takes all the risks, even more than Nick's character. Nick Nolte is just kind of a prankster in the beginning, and you take all the risks, and then as the as it goes on. You, your character really wants freedom, but then she keeps getting sort of kind of um, constrained down to, to you know, when you, when you ended up marrying Bill Bixby or when – because Rudy wanted you as a wife the entire time. So you, you kept fighting for freedom. So it was a really good performance. How you, I, I think that, you know, I, 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 it was sort of like I think Rudy's character, the, the character of Rudy was just too straight for, yeah. for Julie and that um, – I think that Bill Bixby seemed exciting, and I mean his character. Um, oh my God, we got to find the characters' names here because I forget them well, all. Robert Reed's character is Teddy Boylan. And oh, Bill that's Bixby, right. Yeah, Teddy Bill Bixby Boylan. and Willie Abbott. So that's. Oh, uh, Willie Abbott. Thank you. Now it all comes back to me. Thank yeah. you. Um, but I think that, and I, and both of these actors were absolutely amazing. As I say, Robert Reed, who was who who really the American audience had not seen in that sort of character in any way. He was so interesting, such an interesting portrayal. And Bill Bixby, uh he he was he just just nailed that character. He was spot on. And and you what you see is this charming man who you could absolutely see why Julie would fall in love with. Um and he seemed exciting. He seemed he I think he was a PR man or something and 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 I meet him when I'm on Broadway. Uh, not I get a teensy role, like a one line role. Yeah, yeah. And, yeah. He seems exciting, but as it goes on, you see he has a drinking problem. He's an alcoholic, and 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 it's too it's too Julie's credit that she steps aside. And of course, at that point too, you begin to see that Julie starts. In fact, not only do I start drinking a lot, but it's it's Robert Reed who the Teddy Boylan character who really introduces her to alcohol. He serves me some drink, and I think it was daiquiri. <laughs> and it's the yeah. first thing she's ever had like that, and she likes it, you know. Uh, and I think she has that the first time before she sleeps with him. She has a few daiquiris. Um, right. Anyway, it was it was probably kind of risque for that period. I mean, for for TV, obviously, in novels, people were more used to things. But TV in those days, it was it was really straight. I mean, I remember doing some commercials for. Um, I don't know if it was Maiden Form. Probably, it was some sort of bra. I think it was Maiden Form, and. And not only could you not show me in the bra, but I had to go behind these these uh, cutouts of not just a woman in a bra and panties. I, I would go behind one, my head would pop. It was like it sounds so silly nowadays, but Aww. I swear that was true. I would my head would pop out in one, and the next, and the next, and then it was it was a drawing of of the woman's body, but not just in the bra and underwear, but over a leotard. 
<laughs> so no. this is, you know, this is the mid 70s. That's what that's what they could show in those days. It changed rather quickly right after that. I mean, obviously we're in the time of Easy Rider. All everything was starting to change, but but America was still pretty provincial. Yeah. Well, you know, and 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 now your character once she gets uh, to the point, I think it's towards the end of the first part. I mean, it's so long. There's two parts. There's book one and two. Uh, as you start, when you do marry Rudy and, and then you have an alcohol problem, um, your character gets a lot more just frustrated. There's a lot of frustration you had to portray there because you were basically trapped. So. Well, you know, there's, there were a few things, as I recall, and I really need to read the rest of it so that when somebody like you is questioning me, I can remember stuff. But I do remember having, um, when I look back, I think there was this there was this whole thing about my character when she loses a baby. Oh, no, no, I'm sorry. No, I wasn't losing a baby. I have the baby. It's postpartum. It's yeah, postpartum. I mean, and I I'd never heard of postpartum. I read up on it. But nonetheless, I, I you know, um, th- there's always a part of you you have to watch out for as an actor, whether you are stepping back and judging your character. And there's always there would always be a part of me that I have to watch out for because I think I'm I'm like a born prosecutor and I want people to snap out of it, you know. Yeah. Uh, and I felt that Julie was wallowing too long in her depression, but I don't think I really understood, or really I don't think I really understood depression in any way at all. I mean, now obviously at this age, I've had many friends with major depression and I've seen what that is. And of course, nowadays we have all kinds of medication and we find out how many people do suffer from depression. So yeah. postpartum is just a depression that is caused hormonally by giving birth. That's a particular type of depression. And and if I'd really understood that, I think it would have been be, you know better for my character. One of the one of the most difficult things though too, I think, as an actor, and I've had to do it not just in this in this part but others, is portraying depression. Yeah. Because obviously you're you know you're going to be quiet and. Yeah. And your energy is down. Your energy is down. And I think that's difficult. Uh, so much about acting is your energy. That that there was a part of me that, as my character went on and became an alcoholic, um, and I think that all was depression. It was depression about her situation, being married to a man who's a politician, yeah. and all the BS that's involved with that. That I think that... Um, it was it was a long a lot of hours <laughs> in other words into the series that I had to portray that and it certainly was not as much fun as it was to play young. Whereas when I read it when I started reading it I thought oh the young part oh my god I'll never be able to pull that off. I thought and all of us it was difficult. I mean Peter's I think it's just a little older than I am and Nick Nolte was I don't know eight or nine years older than than I think than 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 Peter and I. Oh wow. And. So I think he pulled it off fairly well, considering yeah. I thought in my mid, in my mid twenties it, it would be next to impossible for anyone to believe that I was a teenager. But I wasn't taking into account all that baby fat on my face. <laughs> <laughs> no, it worked. You looked young. Yeah, exactly. That worked. It helped. It. But you were a young person who, like, and a lot of there's a lot of people like this, a lot of girls like this. You know, some girls are married at seventeen, they have kids. You know, I mean, you were a girl, a young girl who was really kind of ahead of her time, her, her age, so you played it perfect. So, You know what's interesting, now that you mention that, James, I'm just thinking that in no, they didn't deal in any way with birth control back then, of course. Yeah. I never remember that being a subject of, of coming up. I mean, obviously this woman was having sex, I think it was right after high school. Yeah. Um, and and, and there's never, there was never anything about the fact that she didn't get pregnant. I well, I mean, they, obviously yeah. not with... Not with Peter, but it would have been, I mean, not with Rudy, but with Ted Boylan. Yeah, I, I think Nick burned the building before you had a chance to spend too much time with him, which was a... Uh, but no, I did spend some time with him. That was just a, a at, at one point. Yeah, at one point he did. <laughs> oh, right. But three great TV actors, or I, I hate to say, you know, narrow them down, but but like icons of TV who, who have all passed away, uh, Bill Bixby, Robert Reed, and Mike Evans. Was another yes, actor. I'm so glad you mentioned Mike Evans right because out. a lot of people don't seem to know him, and I loved him. I thought he was. I love those scenes we did where he plays mm-hmm. a World War II vet who's wounded, and I'm like a candy striper or something, right? Am I yeah, right? Well, I'm asking you because you remember better than no, I do. No, I, working I'm working in at the, the hospital. You're working right, and uh, then there's that whole uh, 
racial thing sort of that's going on about the fact that he's I'm attracted to him, but he's very careful about our he 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 not only asks me to get together with him, but he sort of offers me money, right? He says, I say I want to go to New York, but I really don't have the money. And he says, well, you know, I got this money from the... Uh, right, right. And, the, you know, yeah, it's just sit... It, and he says, it's just sitting there, you know. You could have it or not, whatever. I mean, he was he was wonderful to work with. I loved it. I'm glad you noticed that. Well, yeah, Mike Evans is, uh, you know, he was Lionel on the Jeffersons. And, of course, he was Lionel on, on the family before the Jeffersons. Right. And he also right. is the creator of the show Good Times, Mike Evans, the, 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 the show Good Times is about the Evans family and Mike Evans. You're the, kidding. Uh, I never no, knew that. He was, it, well, it's a, it's a Norman Lear production, but, he, yeah, it's about him. So Good Times, is that's why he left the Jeffersons for a while. Is because So, yeah, he was doing a lot back in those days. Oh, my God. And what happened to him? Do you know? Um, I don't know for sure. I do know he passed away. We've lost almost I all of the too. Jeffersons, which is terrible. Cause it's mm, a, no, I love the Jeffersons. Yeah. But, you know, I hadn't really seen a lot. But when I did Rich Man, Poor Man, I still had, you know, I'd grown up in the Army, and I didn't see, we didn't have TV. Well, by the time we had a TV after Korea and Germany and different places, I'd seen TV at my grandmother's house and immediately wanted to be a comedian because of Carol Burnett and a little bit even when I was very young, seeing I Love Lucy. Oh, wow. And um But then I didn't really see, once we got a TV, I was so used to reading, I didn't really watch TV, and I, I sort of had missed everything. And then when I was modeling, I had acting classes every night, so I still wasn't into it. I mean, now I'm a TV addict, so I don't say this like, but I definitely was, I was always a reader. And uh, I know that I did not know most of these characters. In this, and we also, you and I have talked about Terry Inferno, same thing. I just didn't know who, I knew some of the names, um, I didn't know Ed Asner. I, I don't think I'd ever seen Mary Tyler Moore at that point. Oh, wow. But I l fell in love with him, and I still know him to this day. I adore him. But I did not know Robert Reed's work at all. He was when he it, it was him sharing with me that um, that he was rather frustrated with the part on Brady Bunch. He was obviously a, a trained, a highly trained actor, and yeah. really wanted to branch out. And um, I didn't know anything. I just said, you know, I just heard that he was on this one of those shows, and I, I still to this day get him confused. Uh, yeah, well, there was a was Brady so, Bunch. And, yeah, he was no. You know what happens to you know TV actors, especially at that time. I think is they get typecast, and and everyone knew him as Mr. Brady. I think that was probably frustrating to him because it was like, hey, there's Mr. Brady. You know that happens, but uh, well, exactly. And I think that um, I mean it's it's interesting that that the, that the producers and director. I mean, it was Harv Bennett at the time and David Green, who I think was the best director of them, who did, and I think his best part was the first four hours, too. You know, compared, he did the last, the first four and the last four. Oh, really? The first oh, four, yes, and in between it was... Um, Boris. Well, thank you, Boris Segal, right. Gal. And Boris was good, too, but I mean, I don't think the writing was as good for for the 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 second four hours or the third four hours. Yeah. But I think that, yeah. but if you look at what David Green actually did, in terms of cinematically, um, he he had such a small budget. We had the small budget, but he did as a director, and he had he had basically the same amount of money that every show at Universal at the time, Marcus Welby or uh, Bionic Man or whatever. It was. He had all that 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 yeah. same uh, six million dollar man, right? <laughs> I have to remember oh, the So he didn't have a. He did it so well. Okay, now this is going to come in and out, isn't it? Hold oh, on one okay. second. Don't, don't even worry about it. Just keep going. It, it, there's, if there's little sounds like that, it's all good. I could hear you. You can make them go away. <laughs> okay, all right. It's okay, though. It, it, it's fine. Um, now, speaking of TV, uh, you're familiar with Fonzie and Happy Days, Henry Winkler, of course. Yes. Because you, yes, you were in a movie with, I just want to mention this, this movie, The Lords of Flatbush, of course, it's, it's, it intrigues people at first because it, it, it's with two actors that were about to become very famous. Henry Winkler and Sylvester Stallone, and uh, and but then when you watch the movie, you, you see that the that the great two of the the performance that really stood out to me was Perry King and your your character, the Lord. Oh, Christ. you're so kind. You're so kind. I I I I don't think I did stand out in that. I don't want to go on about it because I love the director. I mean, there's actually two directors listed, but um, but uh, Marty Davidson and I are still very close. I know Stephen Verona, but I think Marty was probably a little more responsible for uh, for the show actually happening, and that was done on a real, a real, 
shoestring budget. I mean, we had yeah. no budget at all. So, um, and I think that Stallone, I think some of the best scenes for me, honestly, are the ones that Stallone wrote. Wow. And he wrote every scene that he's in. Really? And wow. and we, well, we sort of improvised. Surprised. I shouldn't be surprised. I mean, no, I, I, I just think, and I think he was brilliant then as a writer. And at the time, I had read something that he wrote. Um, he'd written a script on Edgar Allan Poe, which, you know, ironically, considering the fact that he became famous, was never done. But I thought it was quite brilliant, and I thought that, that the man really had talent, and he was he was so smart, and yet he was so good at playing this sort of New York, uh, you know, uh, undereducated man. Yeah. And yeah. Um, yeah. And I and I loved and I lo- you know one of the things I love that I'm not sure, but I would guess that probably Henry patterned his character at the Fonz after Stallone's character I've because he was around him true. doing it. Yeah, yeah I mean, because, you know, Henry grew up sort of upper class, I, I think, I may be wrong, but he seemed to be, he certainly was, he grew up in New York City, yeah. which is different than, you know, Brooklyn or in his, you know, the suburbs, um, the, um, not the suburbs, what do you call them, the, um, anyway, you know, New Jersey or Long Island yeah, or any yeah, of those yeah. places, um, the boroughs. Anyway, um, that's the name of the town, Rich Van Porman. I just it just came to me. So. I thought it was Port Phillip. I thought of while we were talking. <laughs> I thought it was something like it was. No, I think it's Port Phillip. It did come to me later. Of course, oh, once I let it go. Okay. Port Phillip. I don't even I know if it's a real place. Said that, that name so many times. I thought. Um, well, you know, I remember from that. I remember Land, King's Landing is where I finally do go off to meet Mike Mike Evans' character. Yeah, I mean, I do, I do go off to meet him, and then Robert Reed drives by and sees me there, and I act like I don't know, you know, I just got lost or something, and I get in his car. So, and then you see Mike Evans' uh, character—I can't remember his name—looking at us like, "Man, we came so close." It was kind of sexy. It was kind of, it, <laughs> it was, was kind of cool. It was and I, I derailed you. You were talking about the Winkler. I, I think that Winkler did. I think I read that he did base Fonzie on Stallone's sort of, hey, that kind of thing. You know, I'm glad you said it because I didn't want to come out and say it, but I'm pretty sure he did. And we all do that. We all, when, when we're doing something, we, we see somebody. It's so easy to see in our mind's eye somebody that we already know, mm-hmm. uh, whether we've lived it like, you know, you know, your aunt or your cousin or whatever, and uh, or a friend in school. And this was so easy because they had just, just you know maybe two years before whatever I guess that he did um, Happy Days, and and wasn't he not scheduled that was that part wasn't supposed to be as big as it was was it? Oh okay, um, I, I, it's funny I interviewed Donnie Most who was on that show. Um, the, the thing about Happy Days that's interesting is when you watch the first season, it is about Ron Howard, you know Ron Howard's character and Patsy Richie and Patsy. It's primarily about them. Fonzie comes in at the last five minutes. He has a blue jacket on, um, <laughs> and he basically just comes in and says, "Hey," and saves him, or he does something. So no, yeah, it, it was a very small part, and then he became the whole show after a couple of years. So. Yeah, I'd heard that. Well, you know, he was he was a high again, highly trained actor. I remember going with with Henry when, when while we were doing Lords of Flatbush, uh-huh. I went to see him do some little improv and some little funky funky plays oh, wow. with a kind of a few friends of his doing improvisational and he was always I just was I just so admired him because he was so smart and so much fun I had some great guys to work with on that I mean I you know Perry and I I just adored Perry and we're still close friends which is lovely because you know a lot of times you still know people but we really bothered to get together and talk on the phone a lot and um and you know we stayed so close over these years he's just one of the nicest actors you'll have to do an interview of him I will arrange it I will love that. I, Perry is, you know, I, I like, you know, some of the uh, movies are bad. I mean, you know, the Andy Warhol movie. and uh, Oh, right, movie, right. You know, Mandingo, which was, you know, it, it's got a camp value sort of cult movie. But, but Tarantino, Quentin Tarantino was very influenced by that. In fact, the movie that's coming out. Uh, Django Unchained, Tarantino's latest movie, is very influenced by Mandingo. So Perry King. No kidding. Oh, yeah, interesting. Like, yeah, they they mentioned Mandingo fighters and all that kind of stuff. But um, now I wanted to uh, go to the another movie you did with Stallone. I think it was the next year. Was um, Capone? Was this a yes. coincidence that you guys worked together again, or did what, what? that was a total coincidence? Yeah. Yes, I've never heard any. I mean, I didn't recommend him, and I don't think he recommended me. Um, in fact, I don't, as I recall, I didn't know he was on it until I was started shooting. Yeah. And, um, I, you know, I just hadn't kept in touch. We'd seen each other a couple times at some parties and so forth, and I knew he was out here. But then I saw that he was on that at that, yeah. So yeah, that you know, was, that, it's yeah. It's a cool movie. Um, this is a Roger Corman production, but it's a very elegant movie. I mean, it, it doesn't have that kind of low-budget 
uh, campy thing like a lot of Corman. It, it's a very serious movie, um, and you play uh, Iris Crawford, who is the girlfriend of Capone. Uh, and this was cool because it was like the classic kind of gangster's mall. Was it fun playing a character like this? It was so much fun. <laughs> I loved it because she was um, she was a, a, a wealthy young lady, a debutante sort of lady who who just wanted to um, who wanted to to experience the other side of town, you know. So yeah. all that was exciting to her, you know, to hang out with somebody who was, um, you know, a gangster. She was a spoiled rich girl in those days, and uh, she was a bad girl. You know, she was a bad girl. She yeah. liked to drink, you know, and there was prohibition. So yeah. she liked to drink, and she liked to be uh, hanging out with a bad guy. You know, women have always been attracted to the bad guy. So that's what that was. So that was fun to do. Yeah, that was it, it's it's really and that movie I didn't even know this until a couple of days ago. It's available on DVD, so it's it's a great one. Um, now, a movie that I really was knocked out by your performance is Report to the Commissioner, um, and you play a an undercover cop in this very gritty, very very cool movie. Um, so tell me about working playing this character, Patty Butler, whose nickname is Chicklet. Well, you know, thank you, first of all, because I love this part. In terms of my early work, you know, it, it's very difficult. I don't know if maybe all actors feel this way, but you certainly get better as you go along. And I think in my case that's really true because it took me a while to sort of relax in front of the camera, even though I'd done a lot of commercials and so forth. It was different in acting, and I found myself... Uh, it just took a little longer than I thought for considering all the studying I had done with all the best teachers in New York, Strasberg and Meisner and Warren Robertson and all those people. It took me a while. And I think that when I was doing a character, any sort of character that I could lose myself in, I, I didn't feel that nervousness. And that's how I felt about Report to the Commissioner. I thought that the part was so well written. I mean, once th This was from a novel. And to just to segue again, the rich man, poor man may have been from a novel, but my, but the, the character I play was four different women. Mm. So it was impossible for me to read that novel. I got oh. too confused. You know, I'd be reading why I'm one person and then I'm totally another person. Wow, and, I didn't know she was a composite character. That's interesting. I mean, I was very lucky as the actress to get yeah. hired to, to, instead of them hiring four actresses, it made my part bigger. But nonetheless, it was not something where I could read the novel and just feel it the way Anybody who, read no, who reads novels do. And, and yeah. another segue is that's totally the reason I'm an actress, was as a child when I said to you that I didn't have TV or I didn't really go to movies, I read all the time. And when you read, it is so, I mean, it's, it's actually impossible not to feel you are that person and to identify and so forth. So in Report to the Commissioner, I had a book. I think it was James Mills wrote the book. And it was a terrific book. And, and he really talks about the complexities of the character, and uh, I think Patty Butler, as I recall, and I haven't seen it in years, was a girl, I think it was Long Island that I was from, and a small town, I mean, a small town girl, you know, even though it's a borough of New York again, but of New York City, but she's, um, she wants to be a cop, it's at a difficult time, and I, I, they actually let me um, hang out for quite a while with the cops and the undercover cops. Mm. In the in I don't remember which place it was in Manhattan. It was yeah. very interesting to see the dynamic that was going on with the with the women because the women, you know, they they weren't as strong. There was still there, you know, it was the time of women's lib when yeah. we shot this. But still, I mean, you know, it's not perfect today, and it certainly wasn't in those days. You know, it was before we were fighting for the ERA, and so and and so there was there was there was sort of a class thing, and women, I feel that women had to prove themselves stronger than any male. And you know the males have to prove themselves to be in the police force to begin with. So there was that, and I think that she was sort of a, um, an interesting, she was interesting on many levels. Wanted to be a cop, wanted to prove herself, and at the same time, there's this attraction that you don't know whether she has attraction to the Tony King character, who is the, the man that, I, that, is, that is running guns and drugs, yeah. And I talked my boss into me going undercover as his girlfriend, as, as sort of a, like a runaway, and yeah. to become his girlfriend. And that means living with him. And, and there's always this little question that I don't remember how, how you feel in watching the movie, whether, because my boss actually asked me, is that, is that, is that it? Is that all there is? And I, yeah, I can't that, remember if that, that was... Is, it's, it's very risque or whatever for that time, too, because, again, just like Rich Man, Poor Man with Mike Evans, it was an African-American character, 
as well. So the cops were were thinking, yeah, hey, there's a lot of it, it's very ahead of its time. This movie, and it uh, really was, and I remember it bothering people, people who talked to me about it, who'd seen oh, the I'm movie sure, afterwards. Yeah, that, yeah. Uh, they 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 didn't like that I had um, all these love scenes with uh, Tony K. <laughs> well, yeah, and that, I mean. He was chasing you in one scene inside the room because you you were and we're uh, both naked, right? <laughs> yeah, well, I don't we're know. naked running through. He's chasing me. It's right before. I'm, oh, I shouldn't say anymore in case anybody watches it. But you know, it was a good movie, and it was it was ahead of its time. And I think, uh, and I, you know, it, you know, if you if you if, in reading the book, you really understood the woman. And I wasn't sure how much they would get it, how much of that would be in the in the the actual movie. I think they captured a lot of it, but I think the the book too is is was was a very good book. I I should reread it. Yeah, you are great, and it's one of my, I'd say it's one of my favorite uh, Susan Blakely performances. Sorry to use you in the third person, but I've watched you. Oh, so no, I love it. Thank you. Like, Thank you. Become, okay, now I, I, I want to, um, another movie, now you play Patty Butler in this, and another movie you play a Patty character was uh, The Towering Inferno, of course, is a whole different t- kind of character, but this movie, The Towering Inferno, is a huge Huge movie. I mean, this was this was obviously your biggest movie you'd done at that point. Yes, I guess it was. You're absolutely right. Of as course, it was it was the biggest blockbuster, right? Yeah, it was. A, yeah. And to this day, people love it. So people yeah. watch it on TV. Yes, I was lucky I did it. So now a character. Now, what do you feel? Now you're, you're in these movies where they're smaller movies and they're low budget, but yet if there's a lot of character going on. Do you ever feel? That the characters get kind of lost in big, giant, spectacular movies like this, or um, what, what yes, I think they like do. It? Yeah, I mean, yeah, it's interesting you ask. I, I think they probably do to, to a degree, but but they're just fun to do. You know, one of my problems in doing this particular part was that I didn't get that it was fun and and just not to make you know it 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 act, actually I think some some people have asked me. I think it's listed when you look on the computer that I did. Um, uh, this before report to the commissioner. Maybe it came out before report to the commissioner. Oh, it was before, yeah, yeah, yeah. But it wasn't, but I didn't. I shot it afterwards. Oh, I see. I did because Mike Frankovich, who was the uh, famous big old, you know, Hollywood mogul who did, who was the producer of report to the commissioner, showed Irwin Allen some rushes as we were shooting it, and I went directly from one to the next. And honestly, I didn't know anything about the disaster movies. I hadn't seen Poseidon Adventure or anything. And it probably would not have been the kind of movie that I would have watched. And I was very bad in those days about accepting movies if they weren't things I watched. Like, you, oh. you know, your audience is going to hate me, but I never watched the 007 movies. Oh, no, I'd no. seen one, and so when I, for years I turned down the 007 parts really? because I felt that they, well, I, I felt that they, you know, that they were sort of uh, chauvinistic about women, you know, and that women were, were portrayed as sex objects, and that was it. Now, Towering Inferno, I, to be honest, I probably would have passed on. So when I say I'm only really lucky that they offered it to me, I'm lucky that I did it, that everybody else was cast. And they, You know, I mean, I hadn't seen a lot of people, but I was a huge fan of Paul Newman and, of course, Steve McQueen, and uh, I didn't really know some of the other ones. I knew who Bill Holden was, and I knew who Fred Astaire was, but I didn't really know all of their work certainly when I went into it. But I was so impressed that they were doing it. And I remember I went home and read the script, and I said, I'd already said yes to it. I said, no, I don't have to read it. And then I went, what? Why are they doing this? It just seemed, it just didn't seem like, you know, honestly, I mean, honestly, it was so, such a well-done movie, and I was completely wrong and an idiot like, like, like a lot of young people. I was wrong about everything, and just, I just lucked out that I got to do it. Um, but I don't think they delve into the characters that much. But, you know, they're entertainment, and that's where... That's where I have this funny story where Steve McQueen, who I had met just briefly and had seen how I looked in those days, I had long thick hair, and he'd seen me on the set, and I, and he was actually living, I think, with Ali McGraw at the time, who I modeled with, and then he saw me come to the set the the first day or the day we had the, the makeup test or whatever, and he said, you don't have to let them, don't don't let them make you look like that, because they, they darkened my hair and it was up, and I said, no, no, no. I made them darken my hair and put it up. I mean, Irwin Allen, the producer, was fighting me. He wanted my oh, hair wow. down and the sexy look and all that. And I was saying, no, 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 because I don't think that my character, I was playing a wealthy um, society girl yeah. uh, in San Francisco, which has, you know, there's high society in San Francisco, yeah. you know, old society. And my my father is a developer and, and, and in that, and I've run in those circles. And I figured that, Richard Chamberlain, my husband, who's the cad, the villain of the piece, of course, that, yeah, 
that I, I figured that he had, that, that he probably married me for my position and money. Oh, yeah. You know, for the position that was, you know. he works with know, the father. He works with of course. Who's your father, yeah. Right, and I did, and I just came. I just come out of modeling, you know. I had a certain kind of look, which I didn't think I should. I didn't think I should take advantage of at the time, which was stupid. Once again, I felt that I should look like a little more mousy, a little more like a really uh, a woman who had only lived in a certain circle of of friends, and and who would have been naive enough to fall for this kind of man, who had probably been charming, who was now I knew messing around on me and had not married me i we we know we're going right into it that the marriage isn't good and so i just didn't think that i my look should be the thing and so anyway steve mcqueen who built a whole career on being smart about things like this looked at me and said no no look the way you looked the other day when i saw you you know put your hair back blonde and long and i went no 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 <laughs> anyway oh, wow. i was wrong and he was right it's kind of funny <laughs> yeah yeah you, you know your character in this actually has a lot of there's some, a lot of stuff going on because you're married to the guy who basically caused this whole thing to happen, but then your dad allowed it, kind of allowed it to happen, or he gave, he gave him. So, you know, you, you're kind of, you know, caught in between some things. So I think a great scene is when Paul Newman comes in, and you kind of flirt with him a little bit. Your character's a little flirtatious. So. Oh, you know, it's funny, God, it's funny you say that because, oh, my gosh, I'll have to watch it again. But he comes to the house. In fact, that's the only scene in the whole movie where my hair is down. Yeah. And I look very different in it, right? Yeah, I <laughs> it's already it's a little brown, but it still it's down. I had so much hair, and people love that scene. But you know, I don't. If if it turned out, if you see that I was flirting with him, James, it was because it was next to impossible for me to be around Paul Newman and <laughs> and not feel as a woman, you know, yeah. just just a, a little a little degree of excitement there. So I don't think I meant to flirt with him. It, you, it just must have come through. <laughs> Well, yeah, and well, I don't know your character. It, it, I, I think also that uh, you know you were a little, a little tired of Richard T Chamberlain's character because he he wasn't a good guy. Um, but this scene, it's a great scene. In fact, um, right now people listening are watching my little slideshow, and I have a picture of you sitting on this. Oh, good. You know, it's beautiful. Now, um, to skip to the part when it gets uh, okay. Oh, I wanted to ask you about. I, I asked somebody. Speaking of the Brady Bunch. Um, Bobby Brady, Robert Reed's youngest son, Bobby Brady, was in this movie, and I actually talked to him. He and was? I asked him about, yeah, I asked him about the fact that there's two directors. There's John Gillerman, and there's um, Irwin Alan Allen. Allen. Do you remember, did, did Gillerman do sort of the more normal scenes, and Allen did Gillerman that? actually directed the whole movie except for the, um, except I, I, I'm pretty sure that Irwin Allen did second unit. He did, okay, okay. He did second unit. You know what's funny? Um, well, not funny, but I mean, I, I became friends when we were shooting this with Sheila Allen. Uh, Sheila Matthews was her acting name, who was married to Irwin Allen. Oh, wow. And she played the mayor's wife, oh, yeah. who was uh, Jack Collins. Yes. In the, in the, it's not a big role, but we were always hanging out together. And I had not, I see her now and then because we're in the same charity here in, in L.A. called Cher. Not like the, not the singer, not C-H-E-R, but <laughs> But S H A R E, and so it's all for it's a children's charity, and she's been involved with it for years. And I hadn't seen her in years, and she came this just this week. She came to a birthday party, and we hung out, and we just chatted together the whole time. And I had the she was always funny and very entertaining, and I had such a good time with her. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and an, another actor is in this, and this is my segue. You're going to know where this is going. Another actor right. in this movie is Robert Wagner. Yes. And that leads to another disaster film that has become one of my personal favorites, uh, Concord Airport 79. Well, good for you. Thank you. We, we it needs, fun. <laughs> needed an audience. <laughs> I didn't know. The audience is this big. I mean, honestly, you know, I'll tell you how, how bad I thought it was, and I shouldn't be saying this, but, but there was a, a party, a very, a very high-powered Hollywood party that I went to. I remember I was sitting at the table with Johnny uh, um, um Johnny, Johnny, Johnny Carson. Sorry, it was my memory. Johnny Carson, and it was—I think it was at, at Norton Simon's house. And Jennifer Simon, of course, who was in this movie, uh, Jennifer Jones was her acting name. And um, oh no, I'm sorry, that wasn't the party. It was another party that was a big Hollywood party. And and the producer of this movie was um, oh my God, can you remember I'll find the, the it, producer? I'll find it. 
of of the of the Concord movie, Jenny Jenny's Lang. Oh, Jenny's, Jenny's Lang, Lang. Of course, yeah, Jenny did a lot of stuff. And it was just so it was this big Hollywood party, and Jenny's Lang walked in, and we were in the middle of shooting. We hadn't finished, but we got about three three quarters of the way through. And I said, you know what? I, I have to tell you something. I thought everybody knew it was as bad as I thought it was. And I said, I think that you need to release this as a, as a sort of a spoof, as a comedy spoof. Now, I'm, I swear to God, this is before Airplane had ever been on anybody's radar. And I said, you don't have to change a thing. You've got that beating heart with Cicely Tyson over there watching out for the, the heart. In fact, just also this week, I had dinner with Nicholas Coster who I'm also seeing on Saturday, who was in it. I'm a I think fan he, of his. I'm a fan of Oh, his. he's so funny and wonderful. I'll have you do an interview with him. I'll tell I him. Like, I I followed him for a long time. He is hysterical. And he and Cicely Tyson, you wouldn't get this about Cicely Tyson from watching her work, but she is so funny. And he was so funny. And they kept me laughing the whole time. And we just we couldn't stop because we had that damn beating heart. <laughs> and, we were, and then my character, who never gets that Robert Wagner is, is his, his, he played the villain, right. that he's trying to shoot down the plane. And I'm supposed to be the, um, I don't know, the Barbara Walters, the, I, I, I'm supposed to be the top anchor woman that's so smart, but I just don't get it, you know? <laughs> but anyway, really? the night that I, the night that I said it should be a spoof, Jennings Lang's face, and some of the other people, maybe it was a direction, maybe it was a party for that show, but there were all these people, and everyone looked at me. I never laid such a bomb. Everybody was so quiet. No one said a word, then everyone kind of dispersed, you know? <laughs> well, yeah, you know, um, but yeah, yeah, you had a great part. In fact, one scene you, uh, see, let me just say about this movie, um, most of the airport movies, I think there was about three of them before, they're about these giant planes, and the planes don't do much. They just, you know, what, what can a big plane do, and then there's a problem, and but in this movie, it's a Concorde, so the Concorde has to, like, dodge missiles. And, and the, the, so the plane in this is, like, flying all around it, like none of the other movies. And you're inside. What's it like being filmed inside the... the well, you know what's funny? I'm getting, I'm getting a little taste of what it was like for you because you you're, you're, you're younger than I am. So you were a kid watching this, right? Oh, I, no, I, this is, like, last week. <laughs> oh, but, did, when you, but, but when you first saw it? Yeah, yeah, I think, yeah. It was a a teenager... Time. Yeah, right, at least, or, or younger. Well, you know, of course, and I never thought of that because I actually never saw the earlier ones. <laughs> Remember I told you I rarely did movies. This one I kind of got trapped into doing because I had a three-picture deal with ABC, and oh. I didn't like what they were doing with me. And my agent pushed me into this rather than the movie I had wanted to do, which I never found out I had been offered, which was, a, um, anyway, it was a wonderful movie that, that the actress who did it won an Academy Award for. So I kind of got trapped into this movie and was not, again, by the way, I had a great time, mainly because the actors I got to work with. Yeah. My God, I got to work with these fabulous people all in one movie. I mean, I just loved them all. I loved Eddie Albert. I loved George Kennedy, B.B. Anderson. Um, Alan Delon was fun, but and RJ was was a lot of fun because I mainly worked I worked with him a lot, and um, I forgot that the plane was being chased, and <laughs> being well, yeah, shot I mean, down. It's moving all around. I mean, it's you know it, it's because it's a Concorde. It's like a little jet plane. It's not a a big you know it's not a big giant plane. So well, also the, you know it probably maybe at that time then like when I look back at Towering Inferno. I'm sort of impressed with what they did in those days mm, with special yeah. they didn't have special effects they actually shot it and whatever they did on the Concorde it it, it actually was well done for that you're right you should have done better <laughs> now do you remember um inside being inside the fuselage inside the fuselage I guess they call it yes and they did call it a fuselage right? do they you, and you're next to John Davidson and the uh, the plane is going up and down do you remember how they did that kind of thing those special effects did the camera just moved did they move the whole thing or no they 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 moved the we we were moved around quite a bit okay. there was one thing that we had they had built some sort of uh device now that i recall that was sort of like a ferris wheel that went around and around and i was on it and in fact the stuff you hear later i know that that somebody just sent me a scene on twitter it's kind of fun you guys watch me on susan no follow me on susan underscore blakely because <laughs> some people find things like you do james and you put them on Facebook too, but somebody sent me some lost footage from the Concord, and uh, it's kind of a good scene. I really like it. I remember being upset that they cut out certain scenes that I had based my my uh, performance on later in the film of things that were cut out because they had so much to, yeah. to show with the action and everything. But this scene that they put in, but you hear the the screaming and yelling. They actually shot us. Um, um, they shot certain footage and had us 
on this thing that's spinning around of us going down. And, you know, I'm just screaming. I'm screaming and yelling like you would be. But I'm actually, I've taken out a tape recorder, and I'm trying to yell it into the tape recorder. And the more we did it, the higher and higher my voice got, which I think it would. I always went for the reality on things, you know, how real it would be. Um, You know, I, I don't think not that many people are that cool in that situation when you think that's the end. But, yeah, they had a few things, and everything moved around. And there was also a scene where they had set everything up where we crashed into the snow. And yes. they spent, yeah. I think, a whole weekend getting the whole shot ready. Yeah. And um, and I don't think I was in the scene. I seem to remember being by the camera when when they had everything ready. And it was one of those things where they had a bunch of signals where the director says to the AD, the AD says, you know, um, to the to the prop man or the people that are getting ready to, to drop the snow. And it was a gun and it was a, a they had all these different signals, and somehow somebody missed it, and they all went one, two, three, and the camera wasn't on. Oh, my God. I, sw- I swear to God, they had to do it again. I mean, I didn't want to laugh, but I couldn't stop. I, it was just too funny. You know, I was like, oh, my Lord. He said, we got it. Everyone did it, and the director, and then they, the, I guess the uh, the camera operator said, no one said roll them. <laughs> oh, my gosh. So they had to do that all over again. Very expensive, and I shouldn't have laughed, but if you'd been there, you would have, too. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and uh, and I'm, I'm glad they kept the scene in when you're hanging on the, the greenhouse window. That was really cool. You were like spider Oh, that was fun, yes. Yes, I got to do quite a bit of that, but I didn't get to do all of it. They wouldn't let me do it all. I had been a gymnast and used to try and do all of my own stunts, including that scene in Capone where I'm shot. Uh-huh. I mean, I literally did that, rolling down the steps, but, you know, I, I feel guilty now because, of course, I was sort of taking a – not that the stunt person wasn't already hired – but they were there, and I shouldn't have done it because I didn't pad myself. I didn't break any fall. I was black and blue and really stupid. So whenever I see actors doing it, I say, oh, I remember being like that and wanting to do it. it that's, it's, it's like you're a kid when you're doing things like that, like you're playing. Yeah. You know, when you play cops and robbers, cowboys yeah. and Indians, and it's I'm fun. I'm glad you mentioned that scene because that's a, that's a good, that was a surprising, shocking, the death scene in Capone. Uh, yeah, I just remember because I <laughs> it was late at night. We shot in a, a back lot. I don't remember which lot, but uh-huh. I rolled down those stairs, those cement stairs, bumpity 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 bump, yeah. <laughs> without padding. What a fool! <laughs> and they were far away anyway. Could have easily been the stunt girl, <laughs> and didn't break my fall either. I really wanted it to look real. <laughs> oh, cool. Blog Talk Radio, where millions of hosts and listeners gather.